Uh, good evening. I, my name is Irena Grudzińska Gross. I'm the director of the Institute for Human Sciences, and I'm uh, at Boston University. And I'm very happy and very proud to see you here this evening. Uh, this is going to be a fourth lecture uh, in our series on getting to know European Union. And this one is going to be about Austria. Uh, we are um, very happy to talk about that country because uh, perhaps you know that our mother institution, uh, the original Institute for Human Sciences, is located in Vienna and has been founded uh, 25 years ago this weekend. And in fact, uh, this weekend there will be a 25th year celebration uh, of its creation. It has been created in the old times of uh, Cold War. At that moment, it seemed that uh, Vienna was a perfect place uh, in between, between Eastern Europe and Western Europe and a great place to mediate between these two divisions. And this is why uh, some of our colleagues, uh, um, Krzysztof Michalski, who came from Poland, and two of his friends from Germany, uh, Cornelia Klinger and Klaus Nellen, went to Vienna, uh, especially uh, chose this, that city and uh, created that institute, which, uh, among other things, uh, in uh, 2001 uh, inspired the Boston University to create this uh, very institution which is hosting you today. Uh, so um, uh, on the one hand, I'm very happy that uh, we are going to talk about this country. On the other, I have to say that I'm very sorry that uh, Ambassador Novotny, who was supposed to be here and was supposed to talk to us this evening, she fell sick. Uh, and with a high fever, and she was unable to come. And uh, therefore, we are going to have a, um, a replacement. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. And this is Dr. Wolfgang René Zeder, who is the director of the Austrian Press and Information Service at the embassy, a position he has held since October 2006. And previously, he was first secretary for political and economic affairs at the Austrian embassy in Moscow. Uh, and he has uh, uh, experience in talking about Austria and about European Union, and we uh, therefore are very interested in uh, listening what he has to say. Uh, we are going to have uh, the usual um, format. Uh, the uh, evening is going to be moderated by Alan Berger, the senior editorial writer for the Boston Globe. As usual, as uh, all of our evenings <coughs> in the series of getting to know European Union. Uh, the, uh, uh, the session will last approximately an hour and a half. That is, we will start with a, uh, with a presentation uh, and then uh, some questions and conversation with the, with the public. And then I would uh, invite everybody very cordially for a reception uh, outside there to continue the conversation in a less uh, formal environment. So please, Dr. Rosenberg. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, kind words, and thank you very much for providing me the opportunity to um, speak a little bit about Austria, Austria's experience as an EU member uh, state, and um, the implications we have witnessed uh, since we became um, members of the European Union. Um, I, I also wanted to extend um, uh, the greetings of our ambassador, who unfortunately couldn't come. Uh, she fell sick, and uh, she asked me to replace her, and it was very short term. She would have liked to come, and as I, as I heard today, she was here in 2005, too. Um, and um, uh, appreciates also the opportunity to, uh, to uh, provide um, her experience uh, as a diplomat with the European Union, um, uh, also in the United States. Um, I think this, uh, this um, 
this experience of a, of, a, of, a, of a member state like Austria, we joined the EU in 1995, um, is a very particular one because um, when um, in 1994 there was a referendum uh, on being a EU member country, um, the approval was 67%, which is quite high. And in particular, if you um, see how the discussion is taking uh, place uh, today um, and uh, in the previous years on the EU reform treaty and there were two referenda uh, in two uh, EU member countries um, that were negative and um, that, um, that uh, finally led to a renegotiation of this uh, EU constitution or EU uh, reform treaty. Uh, this shows that there is also quite a lot of skepticism in Europe uh, as to the European Union, as to the benefits of the European Union, as to the services of the European Union. Um, Austria would say, and if you, if you look into the opinion polls, uh, is still and still remains firmly to uh, its membership in the European Union, uh, and um, the, in particular the young generation, uh, and this is what I would like to explain, uh, in the following um, feels uh, and sees very much the benefits of the European Union. Um, in fact, Austria's EU membership, I would say, is a success story. Um, if we look into the new trade opportunities, uh, and this is what I would like to explain uh, in the following. Uh, what happened is that um, since we became a member of the European Union in 1995, uh, there was a rising economic growth, uh, there were rising foreign direct investments, and there was a rising trade exchange. Um, and uh, if we um, take the fact that 7% of the world population lives in the EU, but 19% uh, of imports and exports uh, worldwide take place within this space of the European Union, this shows that this is um, a, very, uh, a very active space and uh, this has a lot of implications for a small or medium-sized country like Austria uh, and uh, uh, exports and, in in uh, and imports um, uh, were rising at this time significantly. Um, now we have um, a significantly uh, higher uh, trade exchange, in particular with those countries who are EU member states. 80% of our trade is with EU member states. Um, so this gives us um, a, very, a very good understanding. And if you, uh, I mean, I was um, assigned to Moscow before, and I know that those countries in Central and Eastern Europe are very interesting trade partners for us. Uh, but if you see how bureaucratic hurdles, how um, uh, problems at the borders, how tariff problems uh, can delay imports and exports and can cause a lot of costs, uh, this is, this is a, a significant factor that being uh, in this single market, um, imports and exports are much more fluent uh, with less additional costs and uh, it is possible to deliver uh, just in time. Um, so this, uh, the consequence was, uh, in fact, that uh, exports and imports were rising. And secondly, foreign direct investments were rising. Austrian foreign direct investments abroad uh, in, the, in the EU in particular, but in particular also in the new EU member states, uh, and also uh, vice versa, uh, foreign investment, uh, direct investment of EU member states in Austria. Uh, and this is what I would say, um, is, is, is the most interesting aspect. We, uh, uh, we, are, we have traditionally very close ties to Central and Eastern Europe because once we were part of the same Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, and those countries like, uh, like uh, Hungary, like the Czech Republic, like Slovenia, uh, those countries have really uh, a very uh, close relationship to us. And uh, soon after, the, uh, the, f uh, um, after the, the Iron Curtain fell, uh, the, the investment, the Austrian investments, uh, went uh, directly into those countries um, in, in several sectors, in the industry, in the telecom telecommunication sector, but in particular also banks. Uh, and right now we have a situation that Austria is investor number one, for example, in Romania, in Slovenia, uh, in Croatia, and in those countries, um, it is not only the Austrian investment that is appreciated, and, and the trade exchange is also the Austrian expertise. Um, and as a second consequence, um, companies like, for example, Coca-Cola, American companies, decided they, should, they, they wanted to establish their headquarters in Vienna and from Vienna a network with their uh, affiliates uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, 
due to many reasons, and one of the main reasons, of course, that uh, the central position of Vienna uh, and the very good um, uh, network of uh, and infrastructure and um, and the possibility to, to, to make use of, um, of all the expertise that can be provided um, by Austrian experts um, in regards to investing uh, in those new member states and in, in also in, in the Western Balkans, um, et cetera. What happened is um, the foreign direct investments since then uh, had a significant, uh, um, uh, 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 reached a significant number of $37 billion, uh, and also the, 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 the foreign direct investments in Austria. And uh, what, what is, um, I would say, an interesting side effect is that, uh, that young people who um, who uh, were not as dynamic as they, they, uh, as, as they are now, uh, are making use of those uh, scholarship programs, of those fellowship programs, uh, of exchange programs, and of academic uh, programs that, uh, that are part of the European Union and, and that are, um, that are op offered and provided uh, not only in Europe but all over the world through the European Union. Um, what is Another uh, interesting economic aspect, and uh, if, if, you, if you visit Austria, it seems uh, to you a very rich country, a wealthy country. Um, but even Austrian regions that were not as developed as others uh, received subsidies from the European Union and could, uh, could improve very much in agriculture and rural development. Uh, the eastern province, Burgenland, for example, uh, received quite a lot of subsidies, uh, and I, some, I, I, I myself witnessed that there has been a great improvement in agriculture in, in these areas um, due to, uh, to subsidies of the European Union. Uh, so this is really um, a very interesting uh, side effect. Um, we know it very well from Spain, from southern Spain. We know, know it very well from southern uh, France. Uh, but even, even countries like Austria benefit from, from these uh, funds that exist for exactly this purpose. And by fulfilling the very strict criteria, macroeconomic criteria, to become a member of the Eurozone, of this uh, currency, the common currency, European currency, uh, we had to also um, try to implement certain criteria uh, as to our budget deficit, as to uh, reducing the inflation rate. And this led us to, um, to improving also our macroeconomic standards and uh, things that, 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 that are also positive side effects uh, for, a, for a EU member country um, and um, that, uh, that have uh, really benefits. Uh, now to come back, what, what happened after, after the Iron Curtain fell? And this was, um, this was um, a long process. Um, I think that uh, one, of, one of the benefits that uh, a, a EU country has, like Hungary or the Czech Republic, is uh, that those countries can uh, develop very quickly um, uh, with the help of Austria and other uh, Western European countries, um, the industry, the infrastructure, the bank sector, etc. cetera. Uh, the second implications, of course, immigration, um, and this is, this is very, very much part of the discussion, what does this mean uh, if uh, uh, in 2011 um, every European citizen uh, can immigrate uh, or can, can move to another country uh, of the European Union uh, and uh, work there without any boundaries? This is, this is a, a process of discussion that was uh, accompanied, of course, uh, with, uh, with the discussion inside Austria and inside other Western, Western European countries, inside Germany. Um, what does this imply? Do we, have, uh, do we really have a need of, of more, um, more workers in many parts of the industry? And uh, the very interesting side effect was uh, that, um, that I think uh, uh, we noticed uh, very often that there is a need of more. Um, uh, there's a need of workers, in particular very in, uh, the, the skilled workers, um, there, Austria is looking uh, for, 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 um, for some um, uh, uh, qualified, interested uh, workers coming to Austria. And what, what is now part of the discussion is 
how will this be in the future? Uh, um, which, which, which are the implications for the future uh, if, um, if, if uh, uh, the, in 2011 there will be no, no transition period anymore and everyone, uh, every European citizen uh, is, um, has the possibility to, to, to move to another country. Um, I, I think uh, the overall success story is that economic figures show that it is a tremendous chance uh, for Austria, for other European countries, uh, and in particular, if we look at uh, the uh, enlargement and, and those new member states, it was a, in, in, it was an, a, a very interesting chance for them. Uh, it is a win-win situation. It is a very dynamic growth, and uh, it uh, it leads to um, uh, a growing. Uh, trade exchange, growing foreign direct investments, growing investments, uh, and also, I would say, um, a closer political cooperation. And, and this is, I would say, the last, uh, the last uh, point for me as a diplomat. What, what has been always very interesting is uh, whenever we meet inside the European Union, uh, we don't speak very much about European problems. I mean, the European problems exist. There are trade uh, problems, there are economic problems, there are problems that have to be discussed inside the European Union. Uh, we have a very um, good instrument uh, uh, as, to, um, as to discussing it inside with the uh, Commission, uh, with the experts of the Commission and the Council. But what is coming afterwards is uh, that most of the problems that we're discussing inside the European Union as diplomats are problems like the Middle East, are problems like Russia, are problems, uh, energy problems in the regard to Russia, are problems like, uh, for example, uh, China and human rights. Uh, and even Latin America or uh, um, Africa or Asia, where Austria is a medium-sized country focused very much uh, on, on this area, it uh, doesn't really have too many diplomatic representations. So we make use of this network uh, of, of, of diplomatic representations, missions of the European Commission. Uh, and on the other hand, we can provide our expertise, uh, our advice uh, to those who would like to know more as to what happens in the Western Balkans, because there we're very much present, there we have our uh, historically very close ties, and there we are really uh, very much, um, uh, uh, very well informed and can provide useful information. So this is very much um, a, a part of this, of this, uh, of this development, uh, which is seen, uh, I would say, uh, by the generation that grew up with it, uh, already is a part of, of Austria. Austria and Europe, this is not anymore as, as divided as it used to be. And um, I mean, I was discussing before when we had um, a cup of tea, um, my personal experience that when I grew up uh, in Austria, I was, uh, I was born in 1974, uh, and uh, I grew up, grew up with the shilling, the Austrian currency. And this Austrian currency is, um, is something that uh, is a very stable currency, is a currency that is a little bit of a symbol of, of, of the reconstruction of Austria. Um, we did a good job. Uh, my, my parents and grandparents' generation did a very good job in um, in, 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 in building up an economy after World War II. We're very grateful for the American assistance in the recovery program um, this, um, uh, 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 through the Marshall Plan. This has been everything a symbol, and very much a symbol of all this uh, is, is the Austrian shilling. Uh, and I grew up with this currency, and when uh, the euro was introduced in 2002, um, I had to begin to get used to it. And I was still thinking, and I must say so far, I'm still thinking in the shilling. Uh, and, and I'm a little bit jealous when I see the very young people who grew up with the euro already and are, are calculating in the euro and um, are already used to it. So I think, I think this is very much a part of the process that, uh, that uh, what we see today, what we perceive as European Union, uh, is something that uh, some of us see it uh, witness a process uh, from the very beginning um, uh, to, to, to nowadays, and some of them grew up with the European Union already an existing part of the Austrian identity uh, and the European identity. And um, 
this leads me to the very last point, um, the, the reform treaty, because this has been a very high in discussion. I suppose the other ambassadors um, spoke a little bit more about this. Um, this was highly discussed in Brussels and um, in all the European capitals. What is going to be the future of the European Union? Uh, the European Union is, is, uh, was established, or the, the European community, in 1957. So we had the 50th anniversary this year. This year. And it was a very small uh, community consisting in, uh, uh, um, in that time of six member states. Uh, right now we have 27 member states. You can imagine how many languages. Uh, and we, ha we have so many new challenges we have to face um, that certain reforms are necessary. Uh, and since I joined the diplomatic service, there has always been a discussion on how, how we're going to reform the European Union. By the way, uh, th there was also always a discussion on, 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 on uh, reforming the, the United Nations or the OSCE. But the one that um, the, the discussion was very, very um, emotional, um, or at least very active in, 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 um, in Austria and in other European countries, were, was the future of the European Union. Because um, the European Union is not, not an international organization. Uh, where unanimous decisions are taken. This means that the Commission and, uh, and the Council can, with a certain majority, uh, take decisions that are implemented and are valid all over Europe, even if a country is not happy with it. Uh, in certain areas, in certain areas, uh, there are unanimous decisions, like foreign security <coughs> policy. Uh, but so this means to, to, to lose or uh, at least to, um, to take into account that part of the sovereignty goes to Brussels and is, is lost by the member states. Therefore, this discussion is, is quite emotional. Uh, and um, what uh, was, of course, uh, a big surprise, um, because Austria also ratified this, this, uh, this uh, uh, new constitution treaty that was negotiated and was ready practically in 2005, um, ratified this treaty, as, as did also other, I think, 18 member states. And then there were the two referenda in, in two countries that were uh, traditionally very pro-European. Uh, and this, um, this, uh, this led to a certain discussion inside Austria. Um, and of course, in Austria, you have also a high number of Eurosceptical persons. Uh, and uh, I, I, I had a lot of discussions with them, and uh, in particular, I mean, I, some of the developments are already uh, so fast that you really, um, you really are not aware of, uh, of, of where the competences of, of Brussels and where the competences of the member states and, and what is decided when and where. Um, so uh, a little bit of lack of transparency and a little bit of, of lack of um, I would say information for the public. Um, although there is the, there are many programs of information uh, trying to to bring about this information, but it has become so complicated, and those treaties are so long, and and the substance is so complicated, uh, that perhaps this this might be one of the reasons why, um, in the end, whenever there is a discussion, everything uh, is then blamed, uh, 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 or the, the the discussion ends up with with the fact that uh, that they they see the the main problem in Brussels and not in the fact that perhaps the problem could be solved at home. Um, so I think this, this um, new reform treaty that has been uh, negotiated, finalized uh, on October 18th, it will be signed in Lisbon, uh, is a very good approach because, uh, first of all, there has been a sort of compromise. Uh, how, will be the, how, how will the institutions be reformed? Um, a new um, a legal uh, identity also uh, of the European Union, uh, and uh, I think a perspective of how uh, the European Union will um, evolve and will um, continue to evolve in the future. Um, and also, of course, with, with the perspective uh, of future enlargements, because this was also a question, how can we enlarge the European Union, um, which has already 27 institutions, and uh, the mechanisms are basically the same as in 1957. So this was, uh, this was also part of the discussion. A and uh, future enlargements, uh, future developments, uh, future integration is something that is now open uh, and uh, is very welcome and uh, has to be discussed. Uh, uh, and it goes without saying that this has to be discussed, of course, inside the European Union and with all member states and uh, listening to all concerns. Uh, of um, uh, the EU citizens. Um, 
I think basically these are most of the points. Uh, I would um, I would I would suggest that uh, that uh, that uh, if there are questions and uh, uh, that I, I would uh, be happy to answer them. Should I remain standing or sh well, should I sit down? Sit okay, yeah. Um, I see a hand up already. I was going to ask one or two questions, but there's no point standing on formality. Well, yes. I was going to make a remark, and I think the skepticism is not so much with Europe as it is with the bureaucrats in Brussels. And I think it was expressed in the early 90s on huge billboards on the Süd Autobahn, which said, Erdäpfelsalat bleibt Erdäpfelsalat. Well, that, that's, that's the thing, you see, because there have been so many uh, very strange, shall we say, decisions coming out of Brussels which rule the European Union regardless of whether uh, there's any ground for it. England, I think, is a particular point because England really never was continental Europe. Um, the other thing is Austria has always been a neighbor of Slovakia. I think it is now no, no longer Ch uh, Czech. Czechian or whatever it's called nowadays, Hungary, but you also were repeatedly the battleground of the Turks. Now, what do you say about Turkey joining the European Union? They are not European. Why not bring in some other Middle Eastern countries which are much more European than Turkey is? Sorry, that's, that's it. Does, does the microphone work? Does it? Oh, okay. Um, I think Turkey is, is one uh, of many uh, um, potential candidates for uh, becoming a EU member country. And um, Turkey has a long history of, um, um, uh, of um, having uh, filed the first application in the 50s uh, for becoming a European member state and, and trying to, um, uh, um, and the negotiations have begun. Uh, Turkey has already um, even finalized, finalized two-thirds of the chapters of the negotiations. Uh, but Turkey has still, still to fulfill certain, um, um, certain uh, obligations that are part of the, of the, um, of the European um, Union uh, legislation and acquis. Uh, and uh, this, this, these are the rules that, 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 um, that, um, uh, that uh, that we all have to, to obey. Uh, Austria's way to the European Union was also not something that was, uh, this was also a long development. Um, perhaps you remember this because uh, in our case it was, another, it was another obstacle, it was our neutrality. And in that time, um, I wouldn't say obstacle, but it was in that time um, really discussion, can we be uh, part of uh, this Western European Union um, which also has a sort of um, uh, security aspect, defense policy, etc. Uh, not like NATO, uh, but uh, already with a certain with a certain um, uh, security policy aspect. Can we can we be part of this of this of this uh, area? Uh, and it was after uh, after the end of the Cold War that we finally um, became 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 uh, members of the European a uh, member state of the European Union. So this was a long negotiation process, and I wouldn't say negotiation, but a long process until we finally became a member state of the European Union. In case of Turkey, uh, there are certain uh, very clear uh, legal regulations. It, it deals also with, it has to do with uh, minority rights, uh, democracy, democratic standards. Um, and um, this, these, are, these are points where um, uh, uh, the legislation of the country has to be completely in line with the European standards. Uh, and um, there, there, there are still some, some points, of course, uh, but uh, uh, there, is, um, there are negotiations ongoing, and Austria is involved and supports these negotiations, uh, and uh, all reforms into this direction are very welcome and uh, supported, and, and we should try to enhance our partnership with Turkey as, as, as much as we can, of course. Um, but also talking about enlargement processes, uh, have in mind that there are other potential candidates uh, like, and this, these are the countries I mentioned also, uh, the Western Balkans like Croatia, for example, um, that also have a very interesting, um, a very interesting economic development, um, emerging economies, and are also um, very much uh, in contact with uh, 
um, political and economic uh, contact with, with, uh, with many European countries. See, I don't understand what the benefits would be to Europe if a non-European country. And you see, if you, if you brought the, the, the Russia in, there's a European country with much wealth. And, and Europe could benefit from that, although they would probably be overwhelmed by the Russians. But Turkey, I can't see any benefit. Now, why don't you bring in Israel? Because they are Europeans in Israel, you know? Well, I, I wouldn't say that, uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 the benefit um, can be seen from a European member state perspective, and the benefit can be seen um, from a perspective um, uh, from, from, from the country that, uh, that applies for membership. Um, I would say that, that, that Turkey uh, is an important, a very important trade partner, and uh, that uh, we, have, um, we have a lot of uh, fields of cooperation. Uh, Aust uh, Turkey has also become a very important energy partner, uh, energy cooperation partner. Uh, and uh, so there are many fields, I would say, of cooperation. Um, uh, where uh, a cooperation would be interesting, but uh, there, 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 there are, I think, two different points. One point is, of course, uh, is the European Union in the current situation able to um, to, uh, to, uh, to to have another enlargement, uh, and this enlargement would imply a number of millions of new EU citizens, um, and. Uh, until reaching this point, of course, certain reforms had to be implemented internally. Certain discussion processes took place. Uh, but until reaching the point that, uh, that the new enlargement can take place, um, including a very large country like Turkey, there, there, had to be, uh, there had to be also a very clear vision of how uh, the European Union should look like, also the institutions. But on the other hand, of course, uh, uh, there, there exist certain benefits but uh, the, the third point is, of course, uh, that every uh, country that, uh, that uh, wants to join the European Union has to fulfill um, um, all the criteria and has to, uh, to, to make sure that, um, that their legislation is in line with, uh, with the European uh, legislation. And there have been certain, uh, certain parts of the legislation um, that, that had to be, um, that, that, that are still not in line with European standards. Yeah. And who is for admission of Turkey in the European Union? Well, I don't, I don't know the, the most recent opinion polls, uh, but uh, there, is, um, there is quite a lot of uh, skepticism inside uh, Europe. There have been opinion polls, and um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to say which in which country there's more skeptic skepticism other than, than in other countries. But inside the European Union, I think there are quite a lot of uh, the percentage of, 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 of European citizens that are saying that uh, we're not ready for this enlargement. Um, the country is simply too large, and the implications uh, as, to, as to immigration, uh, as to free um, movement, um, because this is one of the implications, that once you are a member of the European Union, the EU citizens have the possibility of free movement. Um, and uh, and uh, there are of course transition periods possible, etc. But in the, in the in the in the end, this 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 is a model of uh, of a very integrated space, uh, and which is but it, which is unique because uh, those those countries are still remaining uh, individual countries with a lot of uh, different um, 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 individual characteristics, like different languages, uh, like their historic heritage, etc. So I would say skepticism exists um, throughout Europe. I wouldn't be able to give you a percentage uh, of how many Europeans are pro and how many are contra, uh, but there are, this, this, is a, this is a discussion inside Europe. Um, again, I mean, uh, if, if, you, if you look at the discussion uh, on, on, for example, the EU Constitution Treaty, et cetera, um, there was also a lot of skepticism. Um, um, and uh, what what is but what is uh, finally um, the very positive side when I looked into opinion polls, um, there is also very much of agreement and also very much of support for Europe, uh, in particular with the young generation seeing very many many benefits, um, and also very much um, support as to the um, EU enlargement um, in regard to the Central and Eastern European countries. There's that also been a lot of skepticism. 
um, when when the negotiations began, um, whether this would uh, would would have implications as to immigration uh, of a lot of workers. In fact, many many are. Uh, uh, citizens of the new member states are happy in their country, want to stay at home and benefit of the improvement of economic conditions, of the, of the rising economic growth, of the rising possibilities. Uh, and and um, I remember in those three years I was in Russia now, Russia has become one of the most expensive um, cities um, in, 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 in Europe and in worldwide, um, very high income, uh, Etc. Uh, many many benefits for people working there. So um, the, the 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 implication that automatically once uh, we we enlarge the European Union, uh, people will come to us and uh, we will have a lot of 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 of, of, of new uh, EU citizens working for, uh, looking for jobs. This is not uh, this is not uh, what what in the in, in practice happened. Uh, so this is also part of, of the discussion, but in the end, I think um, facts look a little bit different. Yes, yeah. I'm sorry, uh, we cut you out from uh, your question, so maybe you would like well, to say. I was going to ask something related to the question of Turkey's uh, accession. Um, you know, Turkey is threatening to go into northern Iraq right now um, to pursue uh, the PKK, Kurdish uh, separatists. Um, and another European diplomat, he said it on, on background, so I can't say what country, said if the Turks do that, it'll be absolutely the end of their hope for accession to the EU. Is that the way Austria sees it? Um, I wouldn't say that there is a particular Austrian point of view. This is more, uh, um, this is, I think, uh, one of the points where there's really very much consensus inside the European Union um, that um, this is our understanding. I mean, it's not as much the military operation. I, I mean, this this was also something I when I opened the newspapers, I thought that oh, this is this is going into this direction. Um, I think it's much more um, the Kurdish problem itself. I mean, uh, uh, and, and, and and minority rights um, and um, uh, problems of uh, political uh, I don't know freedom, etc. Uh, and even uh, people coming from there and, granting, and being granted asylum in Europe. Uh, so this shows that there is, uh, that there is um, really in this area um, um, a field where uh, there has to be done a lot and uh, reforms have to go on mm -hmm. to become a EU member state. But uh, I wouldn't say that I, I, mean, I, couldn't, I couldn't really say because I don't have the background information what would be the legal implication now for the EU um, uh, for, for the for the uh, for the, 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 the negotiations with Turkey on uh, accession to the European Union um, uh, in regard to this military operation I, I, I wouldn't be able to say um, what, what I what I really see is very much that uh, that the problem the Kurdish problem and the problem of, of uh, um, uh, how to to guarantee certain minority rights political rights etc this is this is really a big issue and this this has to be uh, part of the negotiations mm -hmm. Isn't there a consensus that one of the basic criteria for any country applying is that it doesn't cross the borders of neighboring states with its armies? Uh, I would, I would, uh, I would see very much this consensus, and um, I think that uh, in all peace efforts, uh, Europe is very much involved. I don't, I don't, I mean, I, I, I haven't um, seen this link very much between um, EU membership uh, and. Uh, of Turkey and, and this military operation in the last days, I've seen it very much more from from the from the from the other perspective whether this uh, this this could could have uh, further consequences uh, worldwide. Um, but um, but uh, generally, yes, there is a consensus as to. Uh, I'm going to ask an, another question, then we'll throw it open to the uh, to the audience, and you can go up to those microphones, if you like, and uh, to ask questions. Um, there was a story that was in the, in the news recently about um, a family of um, people from Kosovo. They were Albanian Kosovars uh, who were refused citizenship in Austria. They'd been living there for five or six years working. They applied for citizenship. Um, they had a 15-year-old girl in the family 
who had completely integrated. She spoke uh, Austrian-German uh, with uh, the accent of the village she lived in. Yeah, no, um, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and um, she was so upset that she ran away and, uh, and said that she would commit suicide if she were forced to leave because uh, she had friends in school and, and she felt completely Austrian. Um, she was hidden for a while by a Catholic priest, and someone had written on his wall, his name was Josef Friedel, had written Muller Friedel. Um, and I gathered on the one hand there was an outpouring of sympathy for her and the family, but on the other hand there was great resentment at these foreigners. Um, and I wonder how is, how are attitudes evolving in Austria on this question? Because I, from what I know, Austria has rather severe uh, restrictions on, on granting citizenship. Yeah, it was it was not uh, citizenship itself. It was asylum in in her case, and um, the the case was high in the news, um, and um, it showed that um, the Austrian society was very much split because it was not. Um, it, it was on the on the one hand, of course, it was this particular case where you s were seeing that that uh, a girl um, of this Kosovo. Um, Albanian family uh, was uh, so well integrated that she didn't really. I mean, that was that was the, the impression that she's she's from up Austria. She was speaking the dialect, uh, the local dialect, and um, so she was seen by the local population, and they were seen as um, um, as as Austrians. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, if you go back and and see uh, how did they immigrate, they applied for asylum. It was rejected. Uh, there was no, there were no legal grounds uh, for uh, granting asylum, and it was very obvious that um, they simply wanted to work in Austria. Um, now, uh, time has passed, and, and this is the critical part of the case. Time has passed, and um, no decision had been taken. And in the meantime, um, they are very well integrated, of course, and uh, one should try to, to, to find a humanitarian solution. I mean, saying that Yes, uh, strict in, uh, strictly, this, this, they, are, they are not uh, the criteria fulfilled for granting asylum. Uh, granting asylum, but it would be, uh, uh, it would be um, uh, because of the humanitarian situation, use uh, or advisable to to grant them uh, a status of, of, of residence and and, 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 and uh, giving them the opportunity to stay in Austria. Um, and this came exactly in a situation when um, the Minister of Interior decided. Um, uh, let's um, le let's try to, to to stick to the law and let's try to close those cases that are still open. Uh, so it was it was a very um, uh, it, it was a, a very um, um, uh, um, I wouldn't say awkward situation, but this this happened exactly in a time when there were these two discussions taking place. Now inside uh, the Austrian population, and this was interesting. Uh, they were split. There were the ones saying that uh, yeah, law is law, and other ones uh, uh, try to to uh, to, um, to go in line with the law and um, have not been granted asylum, have to leave. And, and other ones, uh, other other people are, are not uh, not as, as as obedient and uh, and 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 even hide or whatever. Um, so um, they were more on the on the official side. And and on the other hand, you had a lot of people who were even. Um, uh, taking part at demonstrations and and and, and uh, um, uh, trying to 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 raise their voice in order to um, to find a humanitarian solution. Um, so far, there has been no decision taken. She's still in Austria, uh, but it shows very much. I mean, uh, if if you if you talk about asylum, um, then uh, this this is this is this is very much a homeland security issue, uh, which. Uh, where, where there are very strict laws, uh, very strict regulations, and very strict deadlines, and um, and, and uh, once uh, all the, the um, uh, all the authorities have taken the decision that uh, asylum cannot be granted, then uh, then uh, the decision might easily be negative. Uh, and and what's the next step? I think asylum is a problem that uh, affects not only Austria, but Austria, and this is what I would like, and this was also mentioned in the in the New York Times article, Austria is one of those countries uh, where we have, um, uh, if we if we compare the size um, and, and the per capita um, uh, uh, number of, of asylum seekers, 
we have a lot of asylum seekers. We have, we have uh, many from Russia, many from Chechnya. Um, uh, we have some also from Iraq. But um, I think uh, the, the number of positive decisions uh, is also uh, a fact that shows that we are we're trying to, to do whatever we can. And the Austrian himself, I would consider him very humanitarian. If you see, for example, how Austrians reacted in the, in the Bosnia crisis, um, in the Balkan crisis, when there was a war, and, and Austrians tried to help their neighbors and to, um, to, uh, to help the refugees. Um, there, were, there were humanitarian um, fundraising events um, on TV, and, and it showed that Austrians themselves are trying to, to help them how they can. And inside this village, this psychological re reaction was the same. I mean, even of the, of the I mean, the, the, the Catholic priest was one example, but also the local population is interviewed. So uh, this shows very much, I think, that um, what, what exists in every society, that you have a, a gap between uh, what the official side uh, decides, but after a very long time, and, and what the, 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 the local population sees. But again, this case, I would say, uh, is, uh, is, is a case where a decision had been taken too late, um, and it developed into a humanitarian case. Um, but there are many, many other cases where decisions are taken um, and, and, and asylum is granted. Uh, and there are many cases, of course, where asylum cannot be granted because someone doesn't come as a uh, political refugee, but simply because he's looking for work. Um, those of you who want to ask questions, why don't you go to the microphone, to Irina? Yes, I, I, I would like to ask a question uh, that is, in a certain way, a follow-up to uh, to what you have been talking about now. Uh, I was a, I was a little bit surprised that uh, in your description of. Uh, European Union and uh, the place of Austria in European Union that you stress so much the economic side and not the political side. Uh, I understand that, of course, this is the history of how the European Union was developed, but what is really very interesting now when it stopped to be so controversial as it was at the beginning uh, is uh, how the membership in the European Union changed the political situation inside the member countries. For example, uh, if you could tell us uh, what is, uh, how uh, Austria changed, not uh, only economically as we heard from you, but also politically, uh, what changed in Austria? Austria was a democratic country before, so it wasn't a, a story like in uh, Poland or in the Czech Republic. Uh, were there a very substantial political changes? Well, in regard to Austria, no. No, I wouldn't say that there were significant changes. I mean, we, we had a long discussion before we became a EU member state on, on whether a neutral country can be a member state. Um, and um, this, this, this was, I think, the most important aspect. But politically, I think that uh, there has been, um, since our state treaty in 1955, a very stable development and always very pro-European. Um, we were, uh, were members of all the other association programs, but we were not full members of the European Union. And, uh, and also as, 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 as United Nations member state and having headquarters and being very active in peacekeeping operations and so on and so on. Um, I think politically it has always been our credo to, to, um, to try to um, take part in international initiatives, um, peace building, etc. cetera. Um, therefore, we're, I think that the, 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 um, the vote of the Austrians, 67% pro-Europe um, in favor of EU membership was, uh, was, a, was very much the expression of this. Um, I think this, this has not changed Austria uh, significantly. Um, I could imagine that many other countries have, um, uh, have had more um, pro-anti-Europe discussions inside. What I, think, what I think is important that this development is taking place right now uh, since um, we became members and since um, uh, the last two enlargement rounds uh, and, uh, and the changes that are taking place inside the European Union, 
uh, that this is something that uh, affects Austria and that, that there is uh, very much discussion on this. Um, but uh, as, as I try to explain, I, I see it very much as a win-win situation in many regards. Um, and um, skepticism is, 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 is not uh, as high in, in, in regard to, for example, the Central and East European enlargement as it could uh, be. Or um, So I think that there is very much political consensus. Um, I see it also that inside um, the parliament, uh, most of the cases, there is very much consensus and has always been very much consensus, um, except for one or two opposition parties. You always have in, in political European projects a lot of consensus. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't see so many many changes as 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 to Europe uh, and as to the political implications. Yes, right. I have two points actually. Um, you talked a lot about the economic side and basically the, the status quo and, and how good things are for Europeans, especially Austrians and so forth. You. What's interesting though is you kind of left out uh, what happened seven years ago. Uh, when things were a little bit bleak, uh, and I would say very embarrassing for Austria um, in terms of their membership, um, I'm alluding to the sanctions, EU sanctions against the, the right-wing government in Austria seven years ago. Uh, that's the one thing. The other thing, what I'm actually more interested in is, is there such a thing as a European vision beyond economics? That is. Uh, when Austria joined the EU in 1995, and before that, just before Austria became an EU member, there was a lot of talk about um, the European idea, and Austrian intellectuals would allude to Hugo von Hofmannsthal, to Stefan Zweig, and so forth. And there was a lot of enthusiasm in terms of a new European vision of what it means to be European. And also, uh, four years ago, Jacques Derrida, uh, Jürgen Habermas, and Umberto Eco wrote articles in um, European newspapers about you know, this vision. What is that vision? Um, I don't see anything happening in terms of creating a vision. What does it mean to be European? Does it mean to live in, um, you know, to, to be mobile, to, to move from one place to another? Um, that's nice, but is there an ideological project too? Thank you. Yeah, as to, as to the first question, um, I, um, um, I, I wanted to present more the, the, the implications um, um, of the EU membership um, in regard to Austria. And, and these were particular economic aspects. One of the, um, what, what happened in 2000 when um, the, the government was built the coalition government, um, the People's uh, Party government, uh, built a coalition with the um, with the right wing uh, Freedom Party of Al Qaeda. Uh, but um, if you follow the story of those um, coalitions and of those uh, right wing parties, it, it ended um, with the fact that uh, the, the party split away. Um, the, then there were new elections, um, and in the end, uh, the, 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 the uh, Mr. Haider, who was at that time um, the chief negotiator um, is at least as, uh, as at least in regards to, 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 to the politic of the government, the federal government, uh, no longer very relevant. I mean, he's, he, he's a, um, the Corinthian governor, and this is uh, still his function, but it, um, it is not, uh, he's not playing um, a decisive um, role in, in, inside and uh, inside the government right now, I mean, this is a new coalition government, the Social Democrat Party. Um, so I think this was this was a development at that part, at that time. Of course, um, my experience was also, I mean, I was, um, um, I was uh, in that time in Vienna. Um, we had um, quite a lot of sensitive projects uh, and um, the whole um, uh, situation was uh, completely unexpected uh, that 14 member states uh, take measures or whatever sanctions against 15th member state. This is not in line with the, with the spirit of the European Union and, the, and the, with the treaties. Uh, it was completely unexpected. I think uh, that, uh, that uh, at that time it was already, it, it was also not, not uh, very clear for, for those who initiated those sanctions 
uh, what will be the outcome, and there was no no um, no outcome scenario uh, clear. Uh, and I, I read uh, several memoirs of ambassadors and of uh, presidents and of uh, uh, also foreign uh, 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 statesmen that, that, that really uh, touched upon it but didn't go into detail because at that time it was it was it was a new situation but they they were not really uh, prepared to to handle the situation and. Uh, few months later there was the, the, the same election res result in Italy and um, they didn't repeat the, the whole uh, uh, sanction scenario so and, and 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 also the outcome was that three wise men were appointed to evaluate um, um, how democratic is Austria uh, and and I think this this was this was basically the end of this um, of these sanctions um, it was not very productive, I would say, for, for the whole uh, European discussion, because in particular to, for those countries that um, when those uh, days members, uh, candidates for, for becoming member states, um, they were not really happy with the whole um, discussion and uh, how a member state can be punished or whatever. Um, so I think this, this, was not, this was more counterproductive for the European idea. Um, anyway, I mean, it ended, um, and, um, and uh, a few months later, everyone was in good terms. So I, I, I think it was at that time um, a little bit of, a, of an unexpected situation. Um, what, what is more critical? What would have been more critical if, if, if a right wing, uh, if, 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 if this, this government and this was the government of 2000 and 2006 uh, would have. Uh, and not complied with democratic standards, whatever, but they fully complied with democratic standards, and they uh, and this government uh, uh, had a lot of uh, very very um, useful projects and was also active in very other many other fields like a, a very big restitution package uh, for former forced laborers and victims of the Holocaust, and um, so th these are things that were negotiated at that time with the U.S. administration, and um, I think the people involved were very. Um, very committed to, um, um, to to this project and uh, and also to Europe, um, and, and I think that most most of the facts showed that that um, that, uh, that the government was then doing a very good job. Um, the second question was as to uh, the mission, the, mission vision. the vision. Yeah, um, it, it's interesting because I when I when I grew up it was. Uh, the European community was uh, an economic community, and it was it was not a union yet. It was at that time it was called the European Community, uh, and and what was the most uh, significant fact that in trade issues, uh, it's a competence of the Commission, uh, like WTO issues, etc. Um, and and since then, this this remained very much a competence of the European Community. And then when when they began to to to, to negotiate something else and and to have this with the Maastricht Treaty, this this first idea of the Union and with the pillars, which which this model has also evolved and now with the new uh, treaty, they are no longer the pillars. This is also part of the European Union. Uh, but I always had the impression that. Uh, that um, uh, foreign policy and security policy is something that is a little bit apart because it's very very hard to find a consensus. Um, and because all uh, EU member states have very individual interests due to their uh, unique history. Um, the history of Austria is, is one which I mentioned, uh, which uh, had a, has a very interesting implication, these very close ties to our neighbors. Um, uh, but the history of, um, of other countries, for example, Greece in regard to Turkey or uh, the Baltic states in regard to Russia or whatever, um, has also certain implications. And that it's, it's, I think that uh, in, 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 in certain uh, European uh, questions, it will, it will end up that, uh, that uh, uh, certain EU member states have their particular views. Um, th this is one aspect which, which was always very interesting for me as a diplomat, that, um, that finding foreign security policy, uh, which is European, is something very hard. We have those meetings, we have those uh, uh, council meetings, we have those expert meetings, and we have joint positions. Uh, but there were many, many situations and, uh, where, where individual EU member states took individual decisions, for example, Iraq. Um, now, um, the idea of, of something um, 
of, of, a, of a joint cultural heritage or something like this. I heard this very often in discussions, um, also with diplomats, and uh, there, I think in the end you will find something like a, like, like, like a, a European heritage and uh, like something that is, uh, that is a link or a, a link between many countries in Europe, um, which goes back to, 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 to the 19th century. Uh, where the European concert existed and, and uh, there were six main powers and they were in close contacts and they took decisions on um, what happens basically in Europe. Uh, and, and I think this spirit exists uh, in, in, some, in, some, um, in, in, in some meetings. I, I have felt it. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is very interesting if you go to St. Petersburg and uh, Putin is... Uh, President Putin is, 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 is inviting often to St. Petersburg uh, to summit meetings. Um, you feel very much of this 19th century European spirit. And in that time, many intellectuals were speaking French and were reading French authors. Uh, and uh, if, if, you, um, if you read the Russian authors that were traveling throughout Europe, uh, I mean, um, how many Russians and uh, how many uh, Russians have been, for example, in Baden-Baden and in those uh, European uh, villages uh, and, and wrote a lot of, 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 of um, I would say, very European uh, novels and uh, contributed to this, um, to this European identity that exists. Um, but I, I couldn't find very much of the discussion uh, with European colleagues um, with the purpose of, of finding a a European identity. Whenever, whenever we speak about Europe, and whenever we speak about Europe with others, then we speak about European values and then joint values and common values. But inside the European Union, I, I haven't found this. Uh, I mean, for me, it's it's very much um, that there, there exists something like this. Uh, this this is very much what I feel, um, particular when those summit meetings take place. That one looks for those historic places and one looks goes back to the previous centuries but inside inside europe i'm i haven't seen this vision and uh i mean i wouldn't say i haven't seen this vision but i haven't seen uh, a joint vision um everyone is having his own vision uh and and this this is this this is quite an interesting development but i, I think this is part of the of the development and uh and and uh, we will we will f perhaps in 10 20 20 years Europe will look like it will, will look a little bit different but then there will be f perhaps some more idea of what um, what is the what is the common heritage and the link uh, yes yes I'd like to continue to take advantage of your having been in Moscow and watch these things from a Russian perspective um, and I'd like to go back to the enlargement prospect and one question is, should it include Russia? Uh, you've described the European elements of the Russian tradition. Uh, the other question is uh, the fact that Russia is becoming more authoritarian again, and you were there while it was happening. Doesn't that make it important to extend the enlargement prospect or activate the enlargement prospect for Russia's and Europe's neighbors? In other words, for Ukraine, or for Belarus, uh, for Moldova. I mean, doesn't that give it an urgency that it might not have had uh, when Russia was under Yeltsin? Yeah, uh, I I have um, followed this discussion since 2003, and um, of course, Ukraine is is a, is a very interesting country. I mean, this is a is a very large country. Um, second Slavic country, and it is uh, it uh, it has historic ties with Russia, but on the other hand, uh, there were also historic problems. Um, and, and what happened in 2004 um, with, with, uh, with the presidential elections and, and, and uh, uh, Yushchenko's victory um, was that for, for Russia, this was, very much, this was a very unexpected situation. And the same, the same happened in, in Georgia. And, and what, what what, what, what is interesting is that, uh, that Russia is, 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 uh, is uh, very much trying to maintain certain, um, certain ties and links to those, to those countries that were not only part of the, of the Soviet Union, but also has, there, there, are, there are many other um, historic ties with them, and uh, with whom they are, 
they have uh, very close um, connections also in, in, in regard to business, for example, or uh, economic cooperation. For example, the airplane production is something that is, uh, is a joint airplane production, the, the Ukrainian and the, and the Russian. Uh, what, what, is, what is interesting is uh, how, how did they react uh, in regard to the, to, to, to the question, um, um, should uh, Ukraine or Georgia become a NATO country, and in particular, should Ukraine or Moldova, for example, become a EU member country. Um, I think it's not only what what uh, what others might think, but um, I I think it it applies this here it applies the same as to Turkey as to other member countries. That of course, integration uh, into the European Union is a very long process, and you have to f fulfill a lot of of criteria. Uh, and uh, for the European Union in particular, I mean, if you, if you look at the dimensions uh, and look at the map and see the size of Ukraine and see the size of Europe, I mean, this is a very large country. So um, this would be really a big challenge. The, what, 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 what is interesting is, uh, of course, how to um, improve uh, the, the, the cooperation with those countries and how to develop closer ties. And for this, we have the European neighborhood policy. Uh, this is quite an efficient instrument. Uh, we, can, uh, we can develop cooperation and even uh, build up trade unions, etc. cetera. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can develop a very close cooperation uh, and, uh, and, and as, as soon and as quickly as possible. Uh, whereas the perspective of a European membership uh, perspective is something different. I mean, this is a long process. Um, therefore, I think whatever we can do right now to to, to promote uh, uh, democratic development, to to, to promote uh, market economy, we should do it, and we are doing it. There are many funds, many programs um, that that have exactly this purpose. The the other thing is, of course. Um, and um, as to Ukraine, uh, is, is, is the question whether, in, whether the Ukrainians themselves would like to become members of the European Union. I, uh, this, is, this is also an interesting question. I, uh, the opinion polls gave, gave several uh, pictures. Uh, one of the last was when I left was that definitely uh, there was uh, not very much in favor of NATO. And as to EU, they were neither more neutral, I would say. Um, Perhaps also due to the fact that they're, they're, they're not really aware what, what, what the EU is. I mean, NATO is very well known, but, but the EU is not as well known. Um, but, but again, I think that what we can do in regard to those countries is, that, is, is what we're doing with the European neighborhood policy. And, um, and this is also one of the side aspects that whenever we meet other partners, third countries, uh, in particular human rights situations in, in many other countries or energy problems or whatever, um, Middle East peace process, but also Russia, Ukraine, or, um, or those countries are on the agenda when we when we meet when there are EU, USA, for example, transatlantic meetings. The, this is part of the agenda, and we discuss it. And and, and therefore, um, um, I think that 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 for Europe, this is a very important. Uh, since these are very important partners. Um, but I wouldn't say that becoming a EU member state is is a short term perspective that is realistic and advisable and, and would really have a benefit for, for both sides. Yes. Um, with reference to the Middle Eastern problems, for example, in Pakistan with the suspension of the constitution, or for example, Karuna from Sri Lanka, who they're considering trying in Britain. Right now, it seems that the EU mainly takes a stance, for example, you state a position and that seems to be it because you're dealing with more internal problems. Do you see the European Union taking a more active role in international problems in the future? Yes, definitely. I, I would say that um, the, um, since since 1992, we have this um, this this uh, common foreign security policy. We have joint positions on several issues. Um, we we are also trying to develop a sort of crisis management. Um, in, in many areas, uh, like in Macedonia, etc., we were active and even more active than others, um, than other organizations. Um, 
so I think this this is very much um, this is this is very much the aim of the of the whole uh, process of of trying to improve uh, the, the foreign security policy to to find um, a, a joint answer to to, to problems uh, and, and challenges um, worldwide. Um, and uh, of course, I mean. Um, the European Union will not replace, uh, for example, the United Nations and, and their mandate for peacekeeping, etc. cetera. Uh, but uh, the political statements, are, um, as far as I can see them, um, in, many, in many regards, very strong uh, and, 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 and very decisive and very much in line with our international partners like the US. Um, I mean, uh, as to as to um, peacekeeping missions, etc., we we participate and contribute, uh, and um, there are also some some very European projects. For example, police missions we we developed, etc. But um, but uh, uh, Europe is is definitely trying to um, to cope with those problems and trying to find answers and trying to to provide aid, also financially, of course, yeah. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, and um, if anyone else wants to go up to the microphone. Um, what would be the Austrian view of how the U.S. attitudes toward the European Union ought to change? Uh, there, there will be a new president a um, little more than a year or so. Um, there's bound to be a change, no matter who it is. What would Austria want from uh, a new U.S. president in regard to the European Union? Well, it's interesting because I, I was uh, I was sometimes asking the same question to my Euro to my American friends and, and asking what what will change, and um, I, I think what what is what is uh, very important for us is that uh, that uh, is this commitment to to this transatlantic partnership uh, and friendship, and uh, which, um, as I see, goes. Back to to um, to to the 40s and 50s, when 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 uh, countries, European countries, received a lot of, of aid for reconstruction development, and and this is a friendship, and this is this is a, a partnership, and what we have now with the transatlantic <coughs> partnership and the transatlantic dialogue, this is of course a very important um, uh, institutionalized partnership, uh, but basically uh, what 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 uh, uh, every European uh, 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 statesman wants to have is is, is that in, in basic projects like, for example, how can we combat climate change? Uh, this is one of one of the issues that has been on many agendas, also G8 and and, and uh, international agendas now, United Nations, um, or um, certain humanitarian uh, crises um, like Darfur. Uh, how can we really cooperate and 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 and, and act together? And and, and all other um, international uh, problems that exist uh, in the Middle East, uh, particularly also in regard to Iran and other countries. Uh, I mean, this is this these are these are areas where we want to cooperate, of course. And 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 and, and, and uh, I think this this uh, cooperation in regards to combating international terrorism was is, is one area where there is an absolute consensus that we we have to to cooperate. But I think that uh, whenever uh, an administration, the president is 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 promoting cooperation in many in many areas, also in particular. I mean, just to mention one one example, which. Which was high in the news and climate change and others, and when we can really try to to, to find um, uh, joint answers to many many problems, this this is the, this this is this is the best approach. Um, from the American side, how do you see it? <laughs> uh, well, uh, it can't get worse. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? All right, well, thank you all, and thank you very much. Thank you.